Fellow teachers, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, your convention on higher education. Uh, when I uh, received your invitation, I had initially said uh, that uh, I would come and uh, listen and learn about your concerns, uh, but I would also uh, like to express uh, solidarity with you uh, as you are received uh, by this uh, despotic uh, government that we have uh, today in the garb of democracy. I have, of course, uh, been to JNU many times to give uh, academic seminars. There are many historians and economists uh, at JNU who are very close uh, friends of mine. Uh, some of them are present in this room, others uh, are traveling in different parts of the, the country. I was also honored to be able to stand in solidarity with you in February of 2016 when your university was being labeled as a hub of anti-national activities. I did not necessarily agree with everything that your student activists were saying, but I felt that I had to defend their right to freedom of expression in the most robust terms on the floor of the Lok Sabha. I did not know these students at the time, and whatever my disagreements with them, I admired their courage. Much later, I happened to uh, meet and get to know Kanhaya Kumar. I found myself on the same side with him at a debate in Kolkata. And you will be happy to know that we inflicted a decisive defeat uh, on the other side, which had various BJP representatives led by none other than Baba Ramdev. <laughs> So you can imagine it was a strange kind of wrestling match on a, on a debating stage. But we won by popular acclamation. And later, uh, Shaila Rashid uh, came to visit me uh, in my home at Harvard uh, during uh, a tour of the United States. Now, very often, uh, the rise of universities uh, to preeminence closely track the rise of the countries in which they are located to economic power. Uh, or sometimes there have been empires uh, which uh, have had the resources uh, to build universities be, which we consider to be the finest in the world. That is what you will see if you look at the history of uh, British, German, American universities German universities were some of the very best in the late 19th and early 20th century, and American universities uh, achieved <coughs> true excellence in the second half of the 20th century. But we in India have al always managed to buck that trend. You know, I uh, studied as an undergraduate in a college, uh, as did my sister Brinda much later on, uh, which was established uh, in 1817. That was precisely the decade of the great divergence in the economic fortunes of Europe and Asia, of the West and the East. And yet, we had our intellectuals, our educationists, who made certain that simply the loss of material wealth and political power will not mean that we will lag behind in the domain of knowledge. Instead, we would try and lead in the field of the production and dissemination of knowledge. So if you look at the history of modern universities, there was one very important university which was established in that decade, the 1810s, in fact in 1810, and that was the Humboldtian University, Berlin University. And the founders of that university made a very clear differentiation between what they called Bildung, 
which is holistic liberal education, and Urdu, which was practical training. And these days in our country, I think our government confuses these two categories. And if you fast forward a hundred years later, if you think about the period of the 1910s, or let's say the year just before the onset of the First World War, at that time, if there had been any global rankings of universities, one of my colleagues, Bill Kirby, who is a historian of China, has said that probably 8 out of 10 would have been German universities, and my own university, Harvard, would have had great difficulty in getting into the top, uh, top 20. But even at that time, you know, we were colonized by, by the British. But think about the early 20th century. In 1904, George Nathaniel Curzon launched a vicious assault on university uh, autonomy. And yet, uh, our intellectuals, our scholars, were able to fight back. And this is exactly what they did in the 1910s and the early 1920s. So I hope we can take it, um, inspiration from them and be able to resist uh, the moves that are being taken in the field of higher education by uh, the current government. Of course, what they are trying to do is probably worse than what Curzon attempted in 1904. I will briefly touch upon uh, the points that are listed uh, on the board uh, behind us. I think others have already pointed out that this whole concept of uh, graded uh, autonomy uh, you know, degrades uh, the true meaning of the word uh, university uh, autonomy. And I think uh, our chairperson is absolutely right to point out uh, that there is also uh, a legal difficulty uh, that has not been sufficiently emphasized uh, so far because so long as the Higher Education Commission of India Bill is not enacted, the UGC Act is the law of the land and you cannot in fact violate uh, that law, cannot bypass the you know, Parliament to introduce a dramatic change in the form of what is called graded autonomy. Last week in Parliament, I did uh, raise a question about the institutions of uh, eminence, uh, and I asked the HRB minister uh, about uh, the uh, GEO uh, Institute, uh, which is a non-existent one, and which has been included as one of the six uh, institutions of, uh, of eminence. And I wasn't entirely joking when I said in response to Mr. Yashwan Sinha uh, that the doyans uh, of industry are really now you know, two people whose names uh, begin with A and whose dictates this government uh, must, uh, must obey. And I asked him whether there was not a single central university or state university in our country that had the uh, potential uh, to become a world-class institution. Now, we have to ensure both broad access to higher education, especially uh, among the disadvantaged sections of our populace, but there is not, nothing wrong in our quest for excellence as well. And uh, there are other countries uh, which have uh, decided to give uh, extra support to some of their most promising universities so that they can break into the uh, you know, ranks of the top uh, 100 universities. China is a case in point. They started their efforts in 1993 by selecting 37 universities for special support. Uh, they, did, they went a step further in 1998 uh, that was the centenary of uh, Peking University and what we have to note is that they selected universities, not institutes of technology. They decided to focus on Peking University, Tsinghua University, Fudan University and all of them now are among the top ranked universities of the world including a, a range of other Asian universities like Tokyo University, National University of Singapore 
and so on. So I see nothing wrong and I had suggested that the most promising existing universities, perhaps 10 of them, should be given uh, extra uh, support. Uh, and I had said this in uh, my budget speech way back in 2014. But what this government has done uh, is to include uh, private institutions as well, including non-existent ones. And this, I think, is a ploy to demoralize our best public universities and starve them of resources while giving a leg up to private institutions, whether existing or not, to make unconscionable profits at the expense of our youth. You know, uh, these universities that are being set up are not genuinely not-for-profit universities. We don't really have a robust enough legal framework to distinguish between for-profit and not-for-profit universities as we do have in the United States of America. There are genuine not-for-profit universities there and the few for-profit universities that exist don't do well at all. So I think that uh, this whole exercise of selecting institutions of uh, eminence uh, has uh, had its credibility completely undermined by this decision to award the GEO Institute this uh, label along with five others. I would also say that, you know, one cannot quibble about uh, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, which is a fine institution, having got this uh, recognition, or the two IITs in Mumbai and Delhi. But to be honest, I can't understand why a school of engineering is being set up at JNU if in fact there is uh, an institution of eminence called the Indian Institute of Technology uh, right next door in, uh, in Delhi. And uh, I would also say that there has been a great deal of bias in terms of regions that have been uh, rewarded. If you had followed the Times Higher Education of uh, uh, Rankings, then IIT Kharagpur, you would find, is higher ranked than IIT Delhi. But you choose the QS rankings in order to give one the institution of eminence recognition and deny the other. And I really do think that there are quite eminent institutions uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu and Bengal in particular uh, to which a grave injustice uh, has, been, has been done. And of them I'll mention two. Uh, one is the Institute of uh, Technology in Kharagpur and, other, and the other is Jadavpur University. On the question of uh, the Higher Education Commission of uh, India uh, bill, um, I asked a question again last week uh, on this. And on the floor of the Lok Sabha, the HRD minister gave an assurance that academicians will have a majority and not bureaucrats in the revised draft of the bill. But of course, we don't know what kind of academicians will be appointed uh, to this, uh, this, this commission. You do have an academic of sorts as your vice chancellor today. So uh, we have to be careful about these uh, assurances. But at least I was able to say to him on the floor of the house that I was glad that bureaucrats and ideologues will not dominate uh, the, the Higher Education uh, Commission of India uh, once it gets to be established. Now this bill has not yet been referred to the standing committee. You know, Nilot Paul was not quite accurate when he thought that had already uh, happened. But it is very, very unlikely that this bill, which is in the process of being completely revised, can, uh, it, it can be introduced in what remains of the monsoon session of parliament. So we have some breathing space. And during uh, this period, I think uh, we need to mobilize, we need to get all of the objections recorded and widely publicized. And it is true that uh, even though uh, you know, members of parliament uh, are few in number who will 
uh, be engaged with your concerns, they are precisely the ones who are quite active uh, on the standing committees. Now, I don't happen to be on the standing committee of HRT, I'm on the uh, standing committee on uh, external affairs. I am on the consultative committee, but I'm not consulted very much, and the consultative committees have far less power uh, than the standing committees uh, of, uh, of Parliament. So we have to see, we'll try to make certain that it gets referred to a standing committee. But I will go one step further than what Yashpan Sinha said. Uh, of course, parliamentarians can employ delaying tactics against a pernicious bill that is being sought to be railroaded through. But uh, what I will say is that if we are to save higher education in India, then we must have a change of government at the time of the next election. That is why I will say to all of you uh, is that this is the time for active citizenship. We all have to do much more than simply come out on the day of the election to vote. There have to be, you know, popular movements that have to be organized all across the country. And I will simply end by saying that I hope you will continue to encourage uh, your students uh, to think critically. That is the most important thing that we as teachers can do. You know, they must be prepared to question every dogma. And they should know that there is nothing wrong in demanding freedom. Freedom from caste discrimination, freedom from class exploitation, freedom from gender disparity, and all of these things are something on which university teachers and students should get together. And I did say something else in that speech I made in February of 2016, Students should also be allowed the freedom to make mistakes and to learn from them. We have to take a collective stand against the criminalization of dissent. It was horrifying to see colonial era laws of sedition being hurled against bright and fearless students. And so I really do hope that we will be able to forge a very broad alliance of university students and teachers who will be at the vanguard of the movement in the coming months and years to save both democracy and the cause of education in our country. Thank you very much.